Welcome to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. Episode five, our top five tips for developing structure with our dog. Cool. Um, let's see. What's the next one, Mariana? You want to read that off? Yeah, structured playtime. I'm excited that this one's coming next because you just touched on the importance of it right at the end of uh, duration work there. And it was... The dog needs to understand, of course, what you're asking of them before you start asking things of them for longer periods of time. So structured playtime, obedience drills can be things like, uh, you know, when we say obedience drills could be a fun game out of it. That's when we're talking about really quick repetitions, place, break, place, break, place. And the dog is just flying back and forth, really Mm kind of hammering it home. They're very, their excitement levels are very high. So we're not working the same sort of skill set as we are in duration, but that's, we're just kind of building the prerequisite. We want to make sure that the dog knows exactly what they're doing and really drill it to a point that it's, it's almost not a thought. Like when you're driving, you, you get so good at it that it does, doesn't really take up mental bandwidth anymore. And you're free to do other things safely, like have a conversation. So right. Or text. No, don't yeah, do it. Don't, I, everyone well, does it in America. Come on. Yeah, no, d- no, don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, working mental, dr- and that can be anything, you know, uh, you know, it could be just working sit, break, sit down, you know, and just hammering obedience drills home, making it high energy yourself with lots of fun, lots of toys. Um, a really fun way to go about it, which is why we call it structured playtime, is to make a literal game out of it. I know mm-hmm. that with certain high energy dogs, like I love seeing people work, uh, you know, like Mally puppies that are going to be like, you know, legit competition dogs one day. And they're just so driven. I mean, they like food, but they love the tug toys, you know, yep. or the bite sleeve or what you, so yep. that dog is only too happy to do whatever you ask for it, even for long and very demanding play sessions. And it's amazing to see what you can get out of the dog when you know how to appropriately motivate them. Right. Right. And so let's, I want to kind of break down the structure of a game and then we're going to go over what a structured play time is. Okay. okay. Um, a lot of the domesticated, a lot of domesticated dogs, they don't know how to play completely. I wouldn't say they don't know how to play, but they don't know how to play completely. And so we'll talk about what the definition of, a, of an actual game is. In dog training, you said this term in the last um, in the last uh, podcast, uh, you said a positive feedback loop. Yeah. Right? Um, so uh, just to recap what a positive feedback loop is, a positive feedback loop is a system where the behavior that the dog is doing leads to something that reinforces the next behavior, which loops back to the beginning, which re which, so let's say behavior one happens, reinforces and inspires the dog to do behavior two. Then the end of behavior two inspires the dog to do behavior one again. And then it triggers behavior two. And then that end of trigger behavior two triggers behavior one again. And so what you start seeing is there's kind of this loop that happens, right? So a very common one is the game of fetch, right? So I grab a dog or I grab a ball and and throw a dog. dog. (laughs) I throw the dog. I grab a ball. I throw the ball. The dog is naturally driven by me throwing the ball to go chase it. That's behavior one. The dog puts the ball in his mouth. And now the behavior of bringing the ball back to me is triggered, which makes me throw it again, right? So this becomes a behavior loop. So behavior one is chasing the ball. Behavior two is bringing the ball back, which starts the whole cycle over. I grab the ball and I throw it again, right? And if we kind of see any game that people play, look at basketball. It goes to one side of the court the other side of the court. Look at tennis. It goes to one side of the court, the other side of the court, right? And same thing with football, one end of the field to the other end of the field. So what happens is one, uh, pretty much offense creates a defense. There's there's always the yin and the yang of playing. And what we see in play in general is sometimes the dogs don't finish the loop, right? Now let's talk about like in the game of fetch, for example, I know a lot of clients that their dog will grab the ball, bring it back, but they don't do what? They don't drop it. They don't drop it or let it go, right? So guess what you have to teach in obedience as part of the foundation? Mm -hmm. Drop it, right? You have to teach that fundamental skill or else the loop in play is broken, right? Uh, Same thing with tug of war, right? You mentioned Mal's earlier, um, Belgian Malinois for those of you guys listening. Um, But sometimes these dogs, you know, you could have a cookie next to them or you could have a tug toy and they pick the tug toy 80% of the time, right? (laughs) So it's really interesting because the desire, the thing that the dog likes is to competitively tug against that toy. And it's so funny. If you throw that toy away, like get out of here and you throw it, that dog will go grab that tug toy, bring it back to you because he wants you to tug on it. Right. Right. And so this is again, a positive feedback loop. So 
anytime that we train dogs or play with dogs, we have to make sure that the, that the loop, or I call it, I call it a reinforcement loop, uh, but there's so many names for it, um, that the loop is, is, is uh, complete. Right. And if that loop's not complete, we have to figure out what area sucks and we have to teach that specific area. So again, in regards to fetch, there are dogs who chase the ball. They just don't bring it back. Right. You know, there are dogs who bring toys to the owners, but if you throw it, they won't grab it. Right. So behavior one needs to be taught. Behavior two needs to be hot and any kink in the loop needs to be fixed. Yeah. hundred percent. I can say that my, my personal dogs, all three of my personal dogs, now that I think about it, none of them were fetchers naturally i had to teach all three of them how to fetch they would either there was there was a, a disruption in the link somewhere they wouldn't bring it back or they wouldn't let it go or they just wouldn't chase it in the first place um but then once i got fetch itself going i saw over time you know they'll do it let's say after a couple of weeks we actually get fetch going they bring it they drop it but then a couple of weeks after that they're more excited because they've had time to really learn to enjoy the game Right. right, right. They they get comfortable with it. So again, they're they're kind of their mental bandwidth is free again because they're not calculating every little move anymore. It's just muscle memory now. So mm-hmm. then I would step it up, and now we get into structured playtime. I mean, fetch is already a structured game, like a sport, but I can add extra structure to it. Hey Simba, sit. Okay, now go get it. Down. Now go get it. And hey, I can exactly. I can really push. I can you know down throw the ball. He sees it and he's like on edge, about to break. And if he doesn't then I release now go get it. And you can start to make obedience out of it. But he's so driven for the ball. I don't even think he's aware that we're training so much as we're just we're playing. Right. And then here's here's a perspective that a lot of that the average dog owner doesn't have. Um, but it's super important, right? So you look at two sides of the spectrum. You let's say you have a dog with that's very driven loves balls, squeakers, food, you name it. Um, in essence, to achieve balance, we have to not only play games with the dog, right? So a lot of times people will say, my dog will chase that ball for hours and they throw the ball, they throw the ball, they throw the ball, they throw the ball, they throw the ball. And if you guys remember from our last podcast, we talked about how with certain breeds of dogs, they are just built to when they engage in an impulsive behavior, their body gets hit with uh, with some dopamine, some reinforcing chemicals, some feel good chemicals, some adrenaline, and what happens is they get an extra boost to keep going for another ten minutes, and they keep getting recharged, recharged, recharged. So this is more of a working breed: Vichelot, Weimar Reiner, Belgian Malinois, uh, you know, anything high drive, a terrier, something like that, right? Um, and so what happens is on this side of the spectrum, the way we teach them to calm down or to be more balanced is through structured play. Right. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have dogs who don't know how to play. And they, maybe they were never taught how to play. And if they don't learn how to play, they don't learn, like Mariano's dogs, that positive release, that ability to to have fun, that, that expression of running or hunting or chasing or being competitive. Right. Because that's ultimately what play is for dogs. Right. Right. And so on both sides, if you if you're the type of owner that says, you know, my dog or if you're a trainer dealing with someone like this, um, you know, my dog doesn't play. Oh, there's games. We just have to figure out what the right starter games are for your dog. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and we've then met if some you're pretty dog- nervous dogs, I don't think we've ever met a dog that didn't like one game or another. Yeah. And, and again, it's going to be a slow process. But I tell you what, when you teach that dog to play, you will see the confidence that develops in that dog. Right. Play is one of the most important things across the animal kingdom. Um, And if you can take a dog who doesn't know how to play, um, teach them how to play. And you're going to see that just providing that structure, that discipline of what the dog would consider to be like a sport, like chasing the ball is a sport, tugging is a sport, finding food hidden in between the couch cushions is a sport. Right. Like little things like that. It builds the dog's confidence where you can take an insecure dog and build their confidence to a more balanced level. On the on the flip side of that, you could take a wild spastic untamed dog shout out to your i was gonna say (laughs) an untamed dog and tame them through structured play so this idea of uh, of play and obedience working hand in hand it has to be developed um so that way we can burn the dog's mental brain brain calories pretty much right if we can burn more brain calories we have happier dogs yeah one thing i just want to touch on before we move on here because i think we've hit this very well is what you said earlier, I liked about breaking down the concept of the positive feedback loop itself mm-hmm. and 
the other aspect to it being, of course, in and of itself, a positive feedback loop is something that reinforces itself. And we got into the whole, the dog needs to know the whole thing so that they can do the whole thing. But mm -hmm. in terms of overall structure, the overarching idea of this entire podcast is the more the dog does it, a clear example of why it's beneficial is when you, when you're giving someone or a dog a structure, you're giving them a tangible goal, a directive, like in basketball, the goal is put the ball in the hole. And once you have that, you know, whether or not you did it, which means the dog now has the opportunity to win. Technically, yeah. the dog also has the opportunity to fail, but that's where proper training comes in to limit those opportunities to very minimal. Well, and check it out. The dogs will fail many times in play, but that's the fun part of play. Right. Some Sometimes my dad wins or my owner wins and sometimes the dog wins, right? And this is the important part of play. It's, it's, it's even if you study dog behavior where, where dogs play, sometimes one dog's on top pinning the other one to the ground and then they will on purpose switch with each other. So don't look at play as a competition with your dog. Look at it as a contest, right? Sometimes I win, sometimes you win. Okay, next time we're going to see who wins, right? And so little by little, this way, both parties, the owner and the dog can actually take some enjoyment out of this. Yeah, it's like a competition, but you're both on the same team. It's can we yeah. get better? Can we get better? You know, and just keep pushing that over and over. But over time, when the dog has a very clear understanding, bring it back to me. Okay, there you go. Good job. Here you go. Here's your reward. Here's the ball. I know you like it. And then when they get better at that, okay, sit down. Oh, good. There you go. There's the ball. And so they have tangible, very clear examples that even the dogs understand of, oh, I've done something right. And that becomes its right. own positive feedback loop to combat the negative stuff. Right. Totally. Totally. Awesome. Hope that was helpful, guys. Um, thank you for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers for dog trainers or anyone who's ever fallen in love with me.